Good morning. Good morning. 
Welcome to worship on this, the second Sunday in Lent. Good to have you all with us this morning. Uh, most of the announcements were up there on the big screen for you. Again, just a reminder uh, that on Wednesday evenings, we do have our midweek Lenten services at 6 o'clock each Wednesday. Uh, this week, it'll be the third commandment. Uh, remember the Sabbath day, you know. Uh, don't neglect to worship our Lord. Um, so we invite you to join us for that and hold an evening prayer. Also, there is a prayer room. Just a reminder that during the season of Lent, if you want to uh, uh, have some special time with your Lord, there is a prayer room available for you uh, at the entrance of our south side there. So uh, those are the announcements for today. We're going to be looking at the Old Testament lesson for the theme and focus of our service this morning. So let's begin our worship by standing and singing our opening hymn. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We kneel or sit in confession. We take a moment of silence before our God. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for His sake God forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, He gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us 
bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. to touch you 
reaching to the sky. We ask that life be kind. We ask that life be kind. And watch us from above. And watch us from above. We hope each soul will find. We hope each soul Another soul to love. to Let this be our prayer. Let this be our prayer. Just like every child. Just like every child needs to find a place. Guide us with your grace. Give us faith so we'll be saved. Lead us to a place. Guide us with your grace. Give us faith so to invite all of our young people forward for a children's message. Good morning. How are you today? Okay, will you stand up here with me? Of course you will. Now, if we were going to describe you, someone who said, who is this? What would we say about you? Well, are you a girl or a boy? Boy. What color is your hair? Are you old or are you young? You're old? How old? <laughs> How? Oh, he's eight. Okay, you're eight. So now we kind of know what he looks like. We know we have a blonde boy who's eight years old. What do we know about who you are? Like, what kind of things do you like to do? He likes to play outside. What kind of things do you do outside? Oh, the trampoline. Do you ride horses? You like horses? OK, I kind of figured that. So if we said, who is it? Oh, and do you have a name? Declan, do you have a nickname? Okay, thank you very much, Declan. So, Jesus was with his disciples, and he said, who do people say I am? Well, we kind of found out who you are, didn't we? But when Jesus asked that question, they said, hmm, there's a lot of possibilities here. We could say that Jesus is a friend. We could say that Jesus is a healer, because he healed a lot of people. We could say Jesus is someone who feeds us, because he fed a lot of people. We could say Jesus is a teacher, because he taught a lot of people. And then we could say um, Jesus told us he had a lot of names. He had names like Emmanuel, and he had names like King of Kings, and Lord of Lord, and Prince of Peace, and just lots and lots of names. What's the right answer? Who do people say I am? Peter knew the answer. He said, you are the Christ, because he knew that Jesus was the one that had come to save us. He knew that he was saving us from our sins, and he was the promised Messiah, 
and we're going to hear in the Old Testament reading about Abraham and Jesus. And God had given that promise that there would be a Messiah way back when to Abraham. They had been waiting a very long time. Now, what if somebody said, who do people say I am? What if Jesus would be answering that question about you? Who would he say you were? He would say, that is my child because they were baptized, and I love them. And so how do we show other people that we are God's child? Declan, how do we show people we're God's child? We do good things, don't we? We were kind to people. Just like Jesus was kind to people, now it's our job to show that love that he gave us to other people. Will you pray with me, please? Dear Jesus, I'm so glad I'm your child and that you love me. Help me to show your love to others. Amen. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Declan. The Old Testament reading for today is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 17, beginning there at verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you, throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is taken from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. Holy 
Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 8th chapter. And Jesus went on with His disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, He asked His disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told Him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered Him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them not to tell tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and Seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And he called to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father and with the holy angels." This is the Gospel of the Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord God, our Heavenly Father, you have kept your promise to send a Savior. In Jesus Christ, you have won redemption for our sins and given us the gift of life everlasting as members of your eternal kingdom. Keep us in this grace and truth to the very end. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Some things last longer than others. That's stating the obvious, right? A married couple uh, realized this at their 10th wedding anniversary. Uh, at 10 years into their marriage, they realized that their marriage already lasted longer than almost everything associated with their marriage. The bridal shop from which she brought her dress went out of business. The bakery went bankrupt. Both the florist and the wedding coordinator had since passed. And the minister who married them, no longer in the ministry. Promises don't seem to last very long either. I mean, in our world today, uh, even contracts... Uh, which are just formalized promises, can be broken if you have enough money to hire a lawyer. And what about guarantees? I know a guy who had his house re-roofed, and it came with a 10-year guarantee. Two years after he had it re-roofed, they noticed a leak in the ceiling. When they went to, contract, to contact the um, roofer, they discovered that he had retired, shut down the business, and moved to Florida. The guarantee was worthless. So does that mean that promises are of no use in our world today? That they are just promises are dead, passe in our untrustworthy, devious world? Oh, no. Society to function harmoniously depends on promises. By their very nature, promises obligate us to some action in the future. And people depend upon that. But when we make those promises, we don't really know what it will cost us in the future. When keeping the promise will become inconvenient. Thus, as a society, we put escape clauses in contracts. We look for loopholes in agreements. We insert weasel words into warranties or hold out for renegotiation. Getting stuck in an old promise, we think, are only for those who don't, aren't nimble enough in sidestepping. Thus, Manufacturers don't honor their product warranties. Politicians renege on campaign promises. Corporations shock their pension responsibilities. And ordinary people make exceptions to their promises. It just seems like promises are not valued or taken seriously anymore. Our Old Testament lesson for today is Genesis chapter 17. And in this section of chapter 17, God makes a promise to Abram. Now, this isn't the first time God makes a promise to Abram. You could really see chapter 17 as further information on the promise that God made to Abram in Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, when Abram was then already 75 years old, God promised him three things. That he would be, uh, get land, that uh, he would have offspring that would become a great nation, and that through one of those offsprings, the whole world would be blessed. So here Abram is at 75 years old. That means that Sarah is 65 and God says that he would be the father of a great nation. That's assuming that he had offspring. But he and Sarah had none. Chapter 15 of Genesis. A few chapters later, 
several years later in Abram and Sarai's life. And Abram assumes in that chapter that one of his slaves, as was the custom of the time, would be his heir. And God comes to Abram and says, no, a son of your own body will be your heir. But still, no children. The next chapter, chapter Genesis 16, again, years later, Abram, or Sarah, suggests to Abram that he have an heir through Sarah's maid, Hagar. Ishmael is born. Abram assumes that Ishmael will be his heir. But again, God says, no, that's not what's going to happen. And so this is kind of the backstory to chapter 17. Because in chapter 17, as it says, now Abram is 99 years old, Sarah is 89 years old, and Ishmael is 13 years old. Now, we're not told in Scripture why Ishmael was not the seed from which the descendants of uh, Abram would come from, but we can probably make some really good assumptions based on the context of this story. You can probably assume that God wanted to show Abram and Sarah his power, even in what seemingly seems hopeless situations. You can assume that God wants all descendants of Abram, both by bloodline and by faith, to realize that they are miracle children, miracles of God's power and grace in their lives. And you can safely assume that God wanted to show that he is a God of promises made and promises kept. And so... In chapter 17, God comes to Abram and Sarah and says to them, you will have a child by the time that I come back. As a sign of that promise, I'm changing your names. You will no longer be Abram, but you will be Abraham. And you will no longer be Sarai, but you will be Sarah. But here's something you may not have caught. Did you notice that in verse 1 of our text, that God takes on a new name as well? Yeah, you might not catch it because it's not so obvious in English translations. Up to this point, God has been known either as Yahweh, which, mean, which is usually Lord in four capital letters in our English translation, or he is known as Elohim. Translated, God. But here, in chapter 17, God takes on a new name. A name that he hasn't been called before. The English always translates it as God Almighty. But in Hebrew, it's El Shaddai. In Genesis 1, God is introduced as Elohim. He's there in the very first verse of the Bible. Barashit bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created ve'ed ha'aretz ve'ed ha'shemayim, the heavens and the earth. 2,500 times Elohim is found in the Old Testament. But El Shaddai occurs very rarely. And when it does, it's in moments of significance, in seeming hopeless situations like here with Abram and Sarai. The El of El Shaddai is just short for Elohim, God. But the meaning of El of Shaddai is sort of uncertain. Biblical scholars always translate it as almighty, but that's just making assumption. Shadu is the Hebrew, is an old Hebrew word for mountains. The most common name for mountain in Hebrew is Har, like in Har Megiddo or Harmon, the great mountain to the north. El Shaddai probably means God of the mountains. But if you can make mountains, you're pretty powerful, almighty, right? 
But whatever the precise meaning is of El Shaddai, God comes to them and says to them that he is a God of promises. El Shaddai is first used in the context of keeping promises. And you and I know that sometimes it takes the strength of a mountain to keep your promise. By coming to Abram as El Shaddai, God is reminding Abraham, Abram that he is a God of promises kept. Always. Abram and Sarai, now renamed Abraham and Sarai, is a constant reminder of, uh, that, that they will be the progenitors of a great nation is for, is, that, is, the, that word there tells them that they will be, have a, their promise kept by a son still not yet born. The reality of a kept promises is vital to understanding anything about God. It's only in the essence of promise that God reveals himself as a personable God. Without the essence of promise, God is just an impersonal creator. With the essence of promise, God becomes someone that we mere humans can relate to. Kept promises are part of God's character. The Bible can really be seen as a book telling us about broken promises of humans, but kept promises of God. Even the major divisions of the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, are like the old promise and the new promise. You know, testament can mean promise as well. But to God, it's all the same promise. I will be your God. I am righteous and just, and I hate sin, but I love to show mercy. The old and new is really about how God then shows that mercy to his people. In the old promise, the Old Testament, it's through the sacrifice of animals that God shows mercy to his people. But that sacrifice is pointing to the new, better promise, the New Testament, where God sends his son as Messiah, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And through that sacrifice, the whole world is blessed. The New Testament makes very clear that the real descendants of Abraham are those who have the faith of Abraham. Paul says in Galatians 3.29 that if you are Christ's, then you are Abram's offspring, heirs of the promise. One of the, one of the facts that uh, the scripture like this remind us humans of is that life is grounded in promises. Both our faith, but also our daily life is grounded in promises. History teaches us that as well. When people don't keep their promises, cracks begin to develop in the foundation of life, and society starts collapsing around us. Promises, contracts, pacts are necessary for society to function. Marriage vows, oaths of office, pledges of support, codes of conduct, parental promises, product warranties, these and others' assurances are necessary for communal life. And God, God is the foundation of all promises. God kept his promise to Abram, that one of his descendants will bless the world. And that, obviously, is Jesus. 
That's why Matthew traces the genealogy of Jesus back to Abraham. 2,000 years ago, and God has not forgotten, nor does he renegotiate his promise. But at the right time, the Kairos time, God fulfilled his promise, sending to us the promised one, Jesus, who will save his people from their sins. We lament about our society today, how Promises are broken and society seems to be crumbling down. We live in a culture where people ridicule and make fun of God's word, flaunting it openly in sin in our world around us. And we within the church kind of despair at the dwindling numbers. But God, revealing himself as El Shaddai like he does in our text today, reminds us that he is a God of promises made and promises kept, even when we can't see a way forward. God keeps his promises always, as he did with Abraham. Think about it. When Abraham died, what of those promises had God kept for him? Just a small piece of the second promise that he would be the father of a great nation. One son, Isaac. Abraham believed, and it was fulfilled later on. God promised a descendant of his would bless the world, and that too was kept down the line. But that gives you and I hope. Hope for everyday life, even in a crumbling world. We know that God keeps his promise. And when God tells us that he will forgive our sins, that he will keep us in his grace and mercy, and will ultimately take us home to victory in heaven, we can live every day in hope knowing that just as God has kept all his promises in the past, he will keep that promise to us as well. God makes a way when we see no way. And now may the peace of God, which passes our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand and make confession of the faith that we have in our triune God by speaking together the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we confess, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into heaven. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we do gather our tithes and offerings and worship for our Lord. And also, if you have your attendance card filled out and haven't placed them in our offering plates, we invite you to come forward at this time and place those in our offering plates as well. We worship our Lord through our tithes and offerings.
Please stand for prayer. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. <coughs> Heavenly Father, give us Your Holy Spirit that we might deny ourselves, take up our crosses and follow Your Son through this troubled life into heaven. Prepare us to give up our lives knowing that Christ has already saved them. Lord, in Your mercy, O oh Lord, Give the church and all her servants grace to fulfill the ministries to which you have committed them. Grant us a full measure of your Holy Spirit to lead and guide our call process that we are led to the servant that you have chosen for us here at Ascension. Lord, in your mercy, Heavenly Father, teach us to shun neither our Lord's suffering nor our own. When we endure persecution or ridicule for being your children, Give us faith and perseverance. As you have promised, deliver us out of the hand of the wicked and redeem us from the grasp of the ruthless. Lord, in your mercy. O oh God, Abraham was only one when you called him, but you blessed and multiplied him. Protect mothers with children. Equip fathers to lead and raise their households in your fear and love. Lord, in your mercy. Great physician, we pray you would heal and restore Dan Bachinski, Joanne Campbell, Mark Herbert, Sam Maurer, Scott Roberts, Emily Tingle. Give them your holy care and strength to bear their crosses. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, receive our praise this day for St. Peter and his confession that Jesus is the Christ. We rejoice that your Son builds His church upon this confession and that the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Keep us in this faith all our days. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with His favor and give to you His peace. Amen.